This is Greg Pass with the Americans in Wartime Experience. Today's date, February uh, 25th, 2022, and I am in Arlington, Virginia, and I have the pleasure to sit down with Staff Sergeant Damian Fraser. Did I say that right? Yes, sir. Good enough, right? Good. <laughs> Can you um, give us your full name and where you were born? Full name is uh, Damian Sean Fraser, and I was born in Yonkers, New York. And um, branch of service in your rank and position where you're at? United States Army, and my rank is Staff Sergeant, and I'm currently at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier within HHC, 4th Rear Battalion. Um, schools you've attended, um, you have any college, or what type of training did you go through um, to get to this point in the military? What kind of, um, um, obviously, basic training? What type of AIT, what type of training you had to land yourself to this job? So, from my first assignment at Fort Drum, New York, I transitioned over to Schofield Barracks in Hawaii. That is where I started attending the schools um, that have currently set me up on a better path to success. Uh, unit armor course, uh, unit prevention leader, master resiliency trainer, combatives. And the one thing that usually differs is most volunteers for the old guard drop a packet. However, I came down on orders for reassignment here. When I had come down here, I was up at Honor Guard Company and Presidential Caskets for a year, and then the opportunity came forth for a tryout period at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Maybe I missed it. What was your original MLS when you came in right out of basic training? What was your 11 Bravo, okay. infantryman. And that's used to be just that only 11 Bravos could, could serve in this unit. Is that accurate? Or that is correct, sir. They've changed that since? That is correct. That was here at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Gotcha. It was only an 11 Bravo. Uh, MOS field position. Um, so how, how many years of service did you have before you were assigned here at Arlington? Seven years of service before I was actually, actually closer to eight years of service when I uh, had originally come down on orders here. And um, so you said that you were given a direct assignment. I, I assume this is something you were interested in doing, though. Is that, that accurate? I mean, is it? From the moment I joined the Army, uh, I left basic training or one station unit you know, training, which is the consolidated basic training and AIT in one. I left with an old guard packet and my packet to my first duty station. Uh, I never filled out that old guard packet. However, uh, on our soldier record brief that we have, uh, it does have old guard volunteer, which is how I do believe I ended up in this position here at Fort Myer. So um, what drove you to want, to want to be a part of this? It was always a dream of my twin sister uh, to be in the United States Army. Um, unfortunately, before she left her basic training, she had passed away. I was currently in college at the time uh, for my associates in science paralegal. I left college to achieve our dream together. We did everything together growing up in life. Um, so it was a tribute and an honor to her life and her dream. And after you know, my first contract, the rest was for me. I kind of drank the Kool-Aid and, and went with it. What's her name? Rhiannon. Yeah. What, 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 was her, what was her backstory? Why did she want to be a part of this? She loved the structure and discipline. And that was the one thing she strived for most. Um, she, she was a painter, she was an artist as well. Uh, so she did a lot of artwork, she sang opera, and she grew up as an Irish dancer her whole life as well. So we did, we did all of that together. Uh, then came time for her to kind of buckle down after college and, and really figure out what she wanted to do career-wise. And the military was her calling. And unfortunately, she couldn't achieve that, so. I felt it was my duty to achieve it for us. Very nice. Well, you're here. Um, we're in Arlington right now. You're doing it. Um, tell us what, what you do do. Before you get into that, uh, keep in mind a lot of people watching this may have never even been here before, much less have an understanding on um, really what this means, the importance of this facility, and the importance of how your, your all's role here. So tell us a little bit about, about the Tomb of the Unknown um, and specifically your role on how you serve uh, your country here. So, for those who don't know, or those who have never seen or have visited the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, it's, it's a national shrine that dates back to 1921. Uh, here we have, you know, interred on the plaza three 
unknown soldiers, one from each war, World War I, World War II, and the Korean War, which used to be four to include the Vietnam War. Since then, uh, that Vietnam unknown was disinterred from the plaza. His body was exhumed. Uh, DNA results were done on, on the hip bone, and he was later identified as uh, First Lieutenant Michael J. Blasi. So the question I have gotten before from visitors that don't know uh, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, they've asked if there are remains here. Some believed or had thought that there were never remains here. It was just more of a, a memorial place for recognizing those. Um, but it is a place that we actually hold sacred uh, to our hearts. It's, it's a representation for the additional unidentified soldiers that, we, that there was one selected to represent the rest and to remember why we do it. Um, so what's your role? What, what, what do you do here? I'm a relief commander within First Relief. Um, so not only am I currently the relief commander, but also on the Army side of things, I'm a squad leader. As I go, continue through training um, as a trainee. So I have different parts in the system, but I overall, I, I oversee the operations uh, day to day and, and make the appropriate calls as necessary. And what, what does that entail? Walk, walk us through your regular um, route. I know there's not a lot of routine in, in the military, but if there is routine, I guess this would be the place for it. Um, what, what is it you do every day? In the morning, uh, First and foremost, we wake up and, and get some PT done. So we go to the gym in the morning for an hour. Uh, before we you know, start our work day, we make sure that everything is up to speed. That's going from wreath schedules to make sure that we have everything prepared and ready for that day of execution, making sure that all the soldiers' uniforms are up, set up, uh, ready to go out the door. Um, those are things that typically the badge holders will oversee. Uh, I'm not currently a bachelor, I'm still in training. So my limit on what I can and cannot do is it's a very black and white line. So I usually just stay within my realm. If, if it's something that a badge holder is uh, assessing or dealing with at that time, I just shift to the admin portion, um, or as I like to say, the army portion rather than the tomb portion. It's two different entities, however it does fall under you know, big army. So what is a batch holder? A batch holder is somebody who has gone through training. Uh, we currently have five tests. So you have your test one, test two, full rotation, batch test, and then the board before the regimental commander. And how long does that take to get through that process? It could take anywhere from six to nine months, uh, but we currently have a 12 month time frame to complete training. And if you complete training within those 12 months, you are given the privilege and extended time here of six to 12 more months. So. The only way to, if I understand it correctly, then you have to be a badge holder to actually walk the mat. Is that correct? That is not correct. That's not correct. Okay, correct. So how, how does that work? So you get past a point, as we call OTD or out the door, which means you've portrayed outside performance through training hour in the evenings. Um, you are also proficient on your knowledge, which is one way to get out the door. Um, every 15 minutes prior to the hour, you get asked questions if you meet that criteria of answering the questions correctly, then you get a three minute go is what we call it, to get changed from tomb attire, which is your polo, dress pants, dress shoes, into full ceremonial attire with no deficiencies three for minutes. three minutes, sir. You're a firefighter. Yes, sir. <laughs> then when you get back up to the front, uh, you're inspected, make sure all the brass is clean, make sure everything is ready to go. And then you'll give the thumbs up, if you get that walk or you get that change, both walkers and changers do have to go through this entire cycle. And then you get the privilege to go outside and guard the unknowns. Um, I know it's a 24 hour operation, but um, if you're on duty one day, are you, just, are you doing it one time or are you doing it multiple times? As many times as you can earn it. If you are not a batch holder, you try to earn it as often as you can. It is a privilege, it's not a guarantee, and it's not given. Um, I think that is the one thing that becomes very competitive because some of the people here are also in training as a walker or a changer. So you're not just competing with yourself and your ability, you're also competing against somebody else as well. So who's going to surpass one another in training? 
you know, it's kind of like a fight within a fight. So um, I understand last year, uh, in November, I believe it was, there was a special ceremony, a flower ceremony. Yes, sir. Can you tell us a little bit about the uh, preparation um, that went into that and basically what the ceremony was all about? Yes, sir. So for the preparation, we worked the 9th of November, uh, even though it took place on the 9th and the 10th. Uh, we had the, the honor to be here on the 9th. What we did was days prior, because it was going to be a different guard change that day, and that was to kind of expedite the shift of walkers versus the population that wanted to come through and honor the unknowns or, or lay a flower for the unknowns during that time frame. So we would take training at night, or we would take time training at night to make sure that that sequence was executed perfectly, that there were no flaws or questions or deviations from what we would typically do, get that done within a timely manner so that there was, there was the ability for more people to come out and, and pay their respects. Um, I assume you, you were there for that? Yes, sir. So uh, tell us a little bit about your observations. Uh, sounds like you, it sounds like you guys did a fantastic job. The, 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 um, did you have a lot of people turn out from the public? We did. Within our first day, if I'm not mistaken, I do believe we had about 16 to 17,000 single flowered stems, uh, single stemmed flowers, excuse me, uh, laid down at the tomb. So how, how did that work? Couldn't have been a free for all, right? I mean, like if I wanted to show up and, and lay, lay a flower, did people, did citizens sign up for that or? Some of the people did sign up for it. Um, those who could not sign up on Eventbrite uh, did just show up. Arlington National Cemetery did provide single stem flowers. Uh, some people did bring their own. And within the first couple hours, the line was completely wrapped around the amphitheater itself, uh, all the way down uh, past section 45, correction 46. So I understand you guys had to do some, uh, make some changes on the way you normally operate. So about moving the mat. Um... Yes, we had to move the mat to the front side of the tomb. When the public comes to view the guard change or they come to pay their respects on the stairs, they typically don't know that that is the back side of the tomb. So what we did was we moved the mat to the front side so there were still eyes on. And it posed what I believe to be minimal obstruction for the walker. It still gave us a bird's eye view if we needed to, uh, to make sure that there were no uh, issues that had arise uh, during the guard change or during the walk during that time frame in between. Everything run pretty smooth? Very smooth, very smooth. Um, it would get to a point where there were so many flowers compiled uh, that we would have to kind of take a, take a moment, move the flowers, lay them around uh, the sarcophagus, uh, and then get back to our actual uh, daily mission. Um, can you describe the public's demeanor? Um, in other words, I've been here myself a few times, and, um, you know, when you look around, certain people react in a different, different manner. Um, in other words, did you have like, a, um, like World War II vets that showed up, did any special VIP groups? Yes, you know? so an hour prior of the cemetery opening, they had opened it up for VIPs. Uh, during that time frame, you had the entire military, of district, military district of Washington's command team come through. You had all of ANC's operations team as well come through. Gold Star families as well. There were four female representatives, which stood out to me more than any other group had. Um, the four women had laid the flowers down for the unknowns, and you could see them holding each other up, crying, walking off of the plaza as they were paying their final respects. You get a chance to uh, interact with the, the public at all? I did. I did get the opportunity. So between the guard changes, um, there was that you know hour delay or hour time frame between each guard change. I would go walk out to the north side of the plaza, make sure things were operating smoothly, making sure if there were any questions that needed to be asked by the public, they could ask me. If there was anybody in uniform that was going to be laying any flowers, I just kind of um, indirectly look them over, making sure everything was good to go. People came here in uniform to show 
their respects, I believe, on a different platform um, and make it known that they're prideful of what they do. Um, it, it was very, it was very surreal. I did not expect the numbers that had turned out for the public that they did because after the 9th and the 10th of the flowers being laid, we, we got to see the full spectrum of what was done on the morning of the 11th. How did it make you feel to be a part of that? I couldn't believe it was happening. I honestly could not believe that I was here during that time frame. I was honored beyond words. Uh, it was speechless at times, and it was very emotional at times as well. So um, I'm told the Crow Nation Honor Guard was there. Are you familiar with that? Yes, sir. Uh, so tell us a little bit about that. So Crow Nation came during the VIP hour to lay flowers at the tomb. Uh, after they had laid the flowers at the tomb, they moved over to the Memorial Amphitheater where they had conducted songs and dances. That's when everybody here at work got up, went outside, went into the amphitheater and got to see what it was about. It was gut-wrenching. It was heartwarming. It was an exhilarating feeling, but it was almost, it was very euphoric um, to see the emotion and appreciation that they had not just for this country, but also for their ancestors as well. So let's talk a little bit more on a personal level. Uh, you talked about um, your motivations to get here. Um, what does it mean, you know, I can't put myself in your shoes, I can only imagine, what does it feel like to participate in something that's this big and that's this important to the nation? I want to be able to share that success with the world. Um, normally, people would say, you know, it is a selfless service. It is 100% something that we do quietly at the end of the day. That I gotta find the words, so I apologize. Um, I have no shame, I have no pride in anyone knowing where I work. Um, I believe it only enhances the education and knowledge of this place. Most people don't know who the tomb guards are. They don't know about the mission. They don't know what we do on a daily basis. I love to share that with the world. I like to share that with my friends and my family. I like to bring them here and I like to tell them about the history of this place. Not many people know what we do on a daily basis, but people also don't know the struggles that each and every one of the unidentified soldiers had to face to get where they are today. What would you like the public to know that we haven't already talked about? That's a tough one. I think most people have a misunderstanding when they come here. Um, the only thing we ask for is silence and respect. The only thing that we want the public to know is when they come here, we just want them to show that respect. Um, people portray their appreciation in different ways, whether it's taking a kneel in prayer, they'll even lay flowers on the stairs because they cannot come onto the plaza any way that they can show their appreciation for service members here in this nation, I think is the one thing that, that we like the most. We, we appreciate that the most, especially those that don't have a family to go home to, and they will never have a family, um, you know, to, to be honored by. We are their family. i got another tough question for you. Um, you're gonna get a copy of this video, um, and we're gonna give you some instructions. If you want to, you can submit it to the Library of Congress uh, for the Veterans History 
project. Theoretically, the video would be kept there for hundreds of years. So your, your uh, great, 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 great grandkids might stumble upon the video one day. What would you want them to know about your service to your country and your service here at the tomb? I didn't do it for me. I didn't do it for me. I wanted my twin had such an impact on my life um, that I always sit back and remember that it's not always about me. When I, for a moment, when I when I sit there and I think that something's about me, I automatically snap back into that mode where it isn't. It isn't. You only have a little time to think about yourself, and that's usually before I go to sleep. And other than that, I, I do it for my family. I do it for this country. And I would only hope that people would carry that tradition. Well said. Um, is there anything else you want to talk about um, in regards to this? No, sir. Well, on behalf of the Americans in Wartime Museum, I thank you for spending some time with us. And more importantly, thank you for your service. Thank you so much, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you.